Hello, hi there, welcome to a full topic video looking at monopolistic competition. It's key market structure and uh, it's a form of imperfect competition, which is pretty close to perfect competition, uh, but uh, I think more realistic in part because we drop the assumption that every product, every good or service is homogenous. So in monopolistic competition, uh, there are many firms, but they're each selling differentiated products and that means that they each have some degree of price setting power. They're going to have a downward sloping average and marginal revenue curve. But because there's many substitutes in the market, they're pretty close to each other. Uh, the cross price elasticity of demand will be pretty high. So product differentiation is, in, is a, a key aspect of monopolistic competition. It could be the, the quality of the product, the ingredients made in a particular cake, for example, the perceived value function for the purchaser, P people thinking what is the overall value for money? It's not just price, of course, it's quality uh, of the product, product performance, for example, if it's a processing speed, if it's a, a digital item, reliability of the product, the branding is key. A lot of in this market, oftentimes the selling point is the perceived point of differentiation coming from branding or packaging functionality of products and crucially increasingly I think consumers are attuned to the provenance of a product where does the good come from what's been the carbon footprint of of the manufacturing or service provision a lot of people uh, they're concerned about the environmental and social aspects of product supply another key aspect of differentiation is the quality of after sales service to customers and also the availability of replacement parts when things go wrong uh, there are quite a few markets, I think, that come fairly close to monopoly competition. Typically, they tend to be in big towns and cities where there are many small competing suppliers. So it could be the case in a city like London or Liverpool or Glasgow that there are quite a few bakeries, independent bakeries, competing with each other. Now, we know there are a huge number of, well, sorry, we know there are some big, huge bakery businesses, Hovis, Warburton's, Kingsmill, etc. But often there are lying underneath the surface many many smaller firms essentially each competing with each other for the customer of consumers that's certainly true with craft beer sandwich bars and coffee stop coffee shops uh, lots of hairdressing salons are fairly small scale affairs so too dry cleaners and laundrettes uh, and uh, lots of differentiation in in lively towns and cities with many bars and nightclubs those would be the kind of markets and firms that i would associate with monopolistic competition. Dry cleaning is a good example. Uh, there are only five business in the, businesses in the UK with a turnover uh, in this market of more than a million pounds a week. Now, there are some national chains, but not many of them. And as you can see from this chart, the modal number is clearly dry cleaning and washing businesses with a turnover of just over between 2,000 and 5,000 pounds a week. Bakery is a good example, success of bake-off, etc has spawned a huge rise in the number of people trying to run their own bakery stores, uh, making bread, fresh pastries, etc. And that, that number's increased, uh, well, by nearly 50% just in the last 10 or 12 years. Craft beer, another good example, huge increase in the number of people setting up micro breweries. Brewdog's the biggest. Uh, it's a very successful brand. It's almost becoming an industrial brand in many ways, although they're trying to stay true to their craft ale roots. But there are many, many craft beer brands. Those are the sales in the UK. And in fact, there are nearly 2,000 micro breweries in the United Kingdom, each producing many different flavours, different tastes, different products. This is, in many ways, a monopolistic competition, even though we know there are some big giants in the field, particularly in the industrial beer field. So how is short run price and output determined in this market structure? Well, I'm going to draw the analysis for you, take you through the analysis diagram. Starting point is a fairly elastic demand curve, downward sloping because they're selling differentiated products uh, with a downward sloping marginal revenue curve that's twice the gradient. Let's put some cost curves in. There we go, demand's fairly elastic. Put the cost curves in, the short term costs. And that little circle there denotes the profit maximizing price and output P1, Q1. If you're charging price P1, the cost per unit is C1, average cost is C1, and therefore the gap is the profit margin. And this green area shows the total profit that's being made by this firm because they're charging a price above the unit cost of supply. So that's what we call super normal profit. Now, 
uh, super null profit is any profit above normal profit. And normal profit is the minimum return needed to stay in a market or an industry in the long term. It's essentially an opportunity cost. You see, if I put £500,000 into a business, that money could have been put in a bank and earned a rate of interest. That money could have been put into some other market and earned a return. Either way, I need to make a certain profit in one market to justify staying in it because there is another alternative out there somewhere. So we call that normal profit. And normal profit is included in average cost. And therefore, if we're breaking even, we are making normal profit. If we're doing better than that, we call it abnormal or super normal profits. Now, key things. One, this is a market structure with many firms, many consumers, many producers. The concentration ratio tends to be low in monopoly competition. We don't have one or two firms handily dominating the entire market. Okay, so the concentration ratio tends to be quite low. Look out for the data in exams if you can spot it. Non-price competition is really important. Differentiation between suppliers is a key point of sale in terms of getting those orders. And crucially, and this is a really important point, the barriers to entry and exit are low. So there are no obvious, significant, expensive barriers to coming into the market, particularly if the existing players are making good profits. This takes us to this question. How is long run price and output determined in this market structure? Well, here's a situation we had before with a high, the generous good profit being made, the area shown in green. This is likely to lead to new firms coming in. And the assumption in this model is that the principle of minimum differentiation applies in the sense that entering a market with similar products, very closely similar goods and services. It just makes it easier for people to switch. So the principle of minimum differentiation is that if you come into the market with something that's similar to existing products, uh, you may well get some switching, switching taking place be between consumers. High profits signal the entry of new firms with new products. And those profits, therefore, the profits shown in this diagram, on this slide, will tend to get competed away. Now, here's a little exam section, how to get, this is a complex diagram to draw the equilibrium in the long term. So I'm gonna take you through how to draw the diagram in the exam. There's a little, a little trick to make sure you get it right during the stress of the exam. All I've done though is just show you the demand curve and the cost curves that we had before. The entry of new firms, and I'm gonna draw this for you, the entry of new firms will bring down this demand curve because there are now more firms competing for demand. So that demand curve is going to shift this way. I'm going to assume it also becomes more elastic because there are more competing firms in the market. And therefore, the entry of new firms will continue until that point is reached. Can you see average revenue is just tangential to just touching average cost at that point there. Just shift it a little to the left. So that's the profits getting competed away, which is this output there, okay? Apologies if it's a bit scrappy. That's the output we're going to finish with, and that's the price we're going to get. And notice at that point there, price equals um, marginal cost, okay? That's why price equals average cost at that point. So that will be the equilibrium in the long run because the demand has shifted this way until it's just tangential to average cost. In the exam, draw the average revenue curve first, draw it so it's tangential to average cost, then find the output, we'll call it Q2, and that is Q2, and then draw the marginal revenue curve so it cuts MC. So here's the little trick in the exam. Draw yourself a marginal uh, revenue curve. I'll just copy and paste that. Here's our marginal. Has to start where the average starts that go there. So just draw it such that it just cuts MC there. That makes it a profit maximization point. And that, so draw the average first and then draw your marginal to suit. Don't worry too much about getting the precise double gradient effect there. That becomes marginal revenue. And there we go. In the exam, that's the way to draw this nice and quickly. And that is indeed the equilibrium in the market. It's also a sales maximization point 
because they're selling as much as they can consistent with covering their costs. Here's one I did earlier. That is the long run equilibrium in the market where profits have been competed away, competed away by the entry of new products, very closely similar products into the market. So in the long run equilibrium, average revenue equals average cost, just normal profits are being made in equilibrium. There are no barriers to entry and exit, so this means that the profit attracts new suppliers offering differentiated products. As more firms enter the market, the demand curve for existing firms shifts to the left. Sometimes we say that the market becomes saturated. The demand curve moves to the left until it's tangential to the average cost curve. And at the equilibrium in the long term, firms are making just normal profit. One of the key questions you often get given is the extent to which markets lead to economic efficiency in the long run. Let's just spend a minute or so to round off looking at that. Here's our diagram again. That's where we end up. So we end up with a situation where, well, OK, let's think about the efficiencies here. Allocative efficiency, uh, because you're selling differentiated products, you do have some pricing power. So you're going to be pricing above cost. Can you see here that P2 is above the marginal cost? It's not massively above cost. Uh, marginal cost because of course demand's fairly price elastic but there's uh, th there is some pricing power so you get a lot of allocative efficiency productive efficiency one of the arguments here is that because there are so many products in the market no one firm necessarily will achieve and reap the full economies of scale so you may have a loss of productive efficiency notice this output here q2 here is to the left of the minimum average cost point which hints at uh, the fact that firms are not quite operating at minimum unit cost. So there may be the absence of relatively big scale economies in this market, which could be damaging to productive efficiency. What about dynamic efficiency? Well, uh, competition between suppliers drives prices down. Uh, Non-price competition is key. So this is a market where you may well see quite a bit of innovation. Um, in terms of offering what's being offered to the consumer. That said, profits, go back to our diagram, they get competed away. So there aren't necessarily the super normal profits to be made, which might encourage research and innovation. And one last point, from a social environmental aspect, we one of the arguments that's coming out of lots of markets is, is the waste, things like food waste, obviously, the externalities that come from packaging perhaps excess packaging uh, that oftentimes just gets sent to landfill. And if you can visualize a kind of an externalities diagram where there are some negative externalities from excessive product packaging and waste. So you can make a case for saying in this market, over packaging uh, as a form of competition can lead to negative externalities and could damage social welfare, social efficiency. Many consumers now increasingly um, moving against products that are excessively packaged uh, to no obvious benefit. There we go. Here, this has been a full topic video on monopolistic competition. I hope you found it useful in terms of giving you that overview of this important market structure.